Hello and welcome to the first ever episode of Science and Technology Reviews. What I'd like to do with this series is to walk you through scientific reports, news, scientific technologies, new, new engineering solutions to problems our world faces, and walk through the principles to see whether or not they're truly um, merit worthy. So today I want to take a look at a paper that was published two years ago claiming that far UVC light is a new tool to control the spread of airborne uh, diseases. Now this hits very close to home because I, my research and my, my students that I mentor research ultraviolet light uh, and its applications. So today we're gonna start here, we're gonna take a look at this report and try to have a better understanding of what their claims really are and how that might impact our society. When we think about ultraviolet light, what I'm gonna say here is that the color of light really, really matters. Now, we're all pretty familiar with visible light. There's lots of different colors we can see. If you go, uh, if you take a range that is above visible with what we call longer wavelengths, then you get to infrared or microwaves or radio waves. If you go below, you get ultraviolet. Then you get to X-rays and gamma rays. Now, if we take a look closer to just ultraviolet rays, we have a range, several different classifications that we call UVA, UVB, UVC, and then vacuum UV. UVA, this here is the type of stuff that will help give you a skin tan. It'll also contribute to a skin burn, even though the UVB range is mostly what we think of when we think of skin burns, sunburns. Now we receive a lot of UVA and a fair amount of UV, UVB through the atmosphere to, our, to ourselves at the surface of the earth. Now the UVB is actually quite limited. Uh, only a small fraction of what the sun puts out is received. The UVC, what we call short wave UV, we really only receive basically none of it at the surface. We receive a lot up at the ozone layer, which absorbs the, the light and uh, takes it away for us uh, by, by going through some chemical reactions. It's basically absorbing all of that energy for us. This stuff is what we can use to kill germs. It's very effective, and we've known for quite a long time, if we look at the, the wavelength 254, we use mercury lamps that emit at 254 nanometers is what we call it. This range of light, this color of light, because we identify the color based on the, the length between two waves in our photon that's traveling. This wavelength is very good at damaging DNA. Um, in fact, this whole range of UVC from 200 to 280 is known to cause DNA damage, which I'll explain in a moment. So we've used 254 for a very long time. We're, re we're studying some new devices that can emit at 278 or thereabouts. This new paper that we're looking at today is discussing a 222 emission of light and that, that color of UV, how that color affects the human body and viruses. So what they did was they took this elaborate setup Ultimately, their goal here was to create an aerosol, to really create airborne conditions. So they had this set up so that they could inject viruses, send the viruses through at a steady pace, expose them in a UV exposure area here, and then the viruses will, so the viruses come through, they're exposed to UV here, and then they keep on flowing and get sampled in this biosampler filter thing here. Now. In this process, they have all sorts of controls to make sure that they have the right particle of vapor, um, moisture particles, the aerosols, and it seems like it's a pretty good setup to do this exposure. Now, what I'll say here is that this is not new for ultraviolet and viruses itself. What they found was that yes, you can destroy viruses over time. So what they have here is the fraction that are still surviving decreasing, so there's fewer and fewer there, as you give it more UV dose. That makes a lot of sense. 
And if you look at it right around here, this corresponds to 99% removal. So what they show is at this dose, two millijoules per centimeter squared, um, you can destroy about 99% of these H1N1 viruses. That's excellent. Now, this is not very different from other UV technologies. This, this is just showing, and this figures from their paper, showing that you can do it. So that's, that's great. Um, that's, I guess, probably expected given that we know UV light has this effect. What they're, what's interesting about their claim is that this particular color of UV, this 222 nanometers, may actually be safe for human exposure. So their theory here is that while we have viruses, bacteria um, that we want to destroy, these, this UV light um, can, can penetrate them and destroy them, but actually this specific color of UV is absorbed so strongly by, um, by materials that it's not gonna go much far, much past the bacteria. It's not gonna go far into an animal cell. So if you look at the size um, comparison of each of these systems, right? We have a bacteria, we have a virus, and these are generically to scale, and this enormous um, animal cell in comparison, and you think about how far the light can go through, this group of authors that have published this paper, it's a group um, that have been working on this for a few years, and they've published a few papers on how far this light can go through. They claim that the UV light at this color can only go about one cell deep into human cells, meaning that it would be safe uh, enough for humans to be exposed to it, given that we usually have a, a layer of dead cells on us anyway. Another concern is getting UV light in our eyes because that will cause blindness. Now, they also claim that the, the liquid tear layer, uh, the very outer surface of our our eyes will absorb enough of this light to make sure that it's safe for human exposure. Now, one thing I'll say here is I have not seen other papers, other researchers provide the same type of data. It's interesting, it may well be true, um, but I haven't seen much on this yet. So I'm personally looking for more information, more studies on that matter. So they claim it's safe, that's, um, in my opinion, could be true, maybe needs some more work to be sure. Okay, let me dig a little bit deeper into why the color matters, and we've talked about this a little bit. Um, as we consider what happens when we change the color into deeper, deeper ultraviolet light, we can eventually have side effects where the molecules in our atmosphere I mentioned earlier, our upper atmosphere, we have an ozone layer because the UV rays are being absorbed by oxygen and ozone. So if that oxygen is acting like a dye that's taking one color, it's absorbing one color, that's gonna block the light that's going through. So one concern I have for the practicality of the system is how far is our light going to travel through our, our air? If we wanted to apply this technology, for example, to uh, protect airports, uh, putting these lights in indoor spaces to protect and purify air as people are walking through, well, chances are maybe it only travels a few feet through the air, maybe a couple of meters. Um, there's a big question there about how effective is it going to be, even if it is safe for human exposure, because it's simply not going to travel very far because the air itself is absorbing light, just as you see with these, these glasses here. Okay, I wanted to touch very briefly on the DNA damage here, uh, because this is consistent between all UV technologies that are using this germicidal range. The reason it's um, where we know that we can uh, inactivate or disinfect germs with UV light is because it, it breaks the way that DNA is replicated. So typically DNA unzips and zips something like a zipper. When UV light hits it, it causes this reaction between two molecules in the DNA and they bind together as if we superglued them. Now if you've 
ever taken a zipper and put some super glue between two spots, you'll notice it doesn't work anymore. I might be speaking from experience there. Okay, so that's why we're concerned about the safety. I mentioned earlier, maybe it's no concern, but we know that that's how UV works. So there, you know, I, again, I would like to see more studies there. Okay, my last concern here is for the accidental production of ozone. Now we know that UV light will strike oxygen molecules and break them apart and create oxygen radicals. These then go and react with other O2 molecules. O2 is the stuff we breathe. O3 is ozone. We don't want to breathe it. It's a lung irritant. It's great in the upper atmosphere, protects us, but we don't want it hanging around. So another thing we know is that UV2, uh, UV185 is used commercially, as seen in this little diagram, to produce ozone. So if you want to generate ozone, one way to do it is just blast our oxygen-rich atmosphere with UV light, and it produces lots and lots of ozone. So this is one concern I have for this new technology. We know that the 254 produces some, and I suspect, based on an increase in the ability of oxygen to absorb the, this lower colored light, lower wavelength, I suspect it's going to produce more ozone than our 254 lamps, which already have some, somewhat of a problem with it. Okay, so what's out there already on the market? Well, we have fluorescent lamps, 254 nanometer lamps. You can buy these. They're commonly used in laboratories, sometimes in hospitals, but importantly, only when there's nobody around or there's protective shielding in place. So these are very hazardous to humans' health, but they're very useful to keep surfaces sterile. There are UV LEDs starting to become uh, cost-effective and marketed. We have some, we're studying some of these in my lab. And recently I saw this new company with a, this innovative technology with microplasma devices where they're creating small little chips that emit at 222, exactly this, um, this type of wavelength that we're interested in using. So there is some prospect in having actual devices emit the type of wavelength that we're interested in with this new paper. Okay, my bottom line here is that regarding safety, it's certainly never safe to have 254 light shining with human exposure. You'll blind people, you'll give them cancer, it's not good. 278, the same thing is true, even if there are some other advantages. 222, that new stuff that this um, paper that we're reviewing today is uh, talking about, I'm putting a question mark here because it may be fine. Um, I'd like to see some more studies, but it apparently, supposedly, is just fine. But maybe there's an ozone hazard if we're going to be blasting this indoors constantly. I think that's a big risk that needs to be taken into consideration. Uh, one last thought here is that these lights, maybe they're not really appropriate for every indoor application, but perhaps within a ventilation system, assuming we have ozone under control. Um, any of these lights, any ultraviolet light may be a great opportunity to keep our air that's recirculating through our systems, through our indoor systems, pure and free from airborne diseases. Now, there's still a, a big risk of transmission direct person to person. It's not very clear to me how, how important the recycling of air is. For example, on an airplane, it might be very important. Maybe in a restaurant, that wouldn't have much impact. Last thing I'll say is UV technologies are great. Uh, always interested in learning more about them. Okay, so if you liked this, please let me know and let me know which technology you'd like me to review next. I will say that I do plan to look at the applications of UV light to medical um, situations, medical applications, uh, with my next video. Thanks and have a good day.